I, I didn't want Evelyn to take that much time introducing me, because that meant I had less time to talk to you. So let's see what we can make work here. I was just. I was going to say thank you all for coming, but you were here anyway. Uh, that's. I'm fundamentally an astrophysicist, so I, yeah, I think about energy all the time, but not so much as it applies to your home appliances. And but there's a revelation that we arrived at in my field some decades ago. There's a fellow named Nikolai Kardashev not to be confused with the Kardashians. <laughs> he thought about how you might measure how advanced a civilization might be. Okay? And so he said, suppose a civilization were so advanced, it managed to tap all of the energy of the entire galaxy in which you live. This would be the hundreds of billions of stars. What you might do is enclose the galaxy in some kind of artificial uh, uh, sphere, and all the energy that would otherwise exit the galaxy, you collect. It was going to be wasted anyway. So, but if you control that much energy, oh my gosh. That's a powerful civilization right there. So he classified that as a category three civilization. So category two civilization, let's come in a little bit from that. You don't control the energy of all the stars in your galaxy. You control all the energy of your host star. Okay, that's the next scale in. So imagine if we controlled all the energy emitted by the sun. It's a lot, you all know. In fact, the sun emits Excuse me, this, we receive in one hour from the sun, we, Earth, receives as much energy in one hour as the entire civilization consumes in a year. And of course, it's renewable. So that's a kind of interesting fact. A lot of sort of wasted energy there. Well, it's not wasted, it drives our climate and things, but. There's other starlight going elsewhere that is getting wasted. So Freeman Dyson, a physicist, said, suppose we did build a sphere. To this day, it's called a Dyson sphere, where at our radius from the sun, you build a sphere that absorbs all the sunlight from the sun. That's bad for Mars and Jupiter. <laughs> you know, They might want a little bit of sunlight every now and then, but... When did that stop humans from behaving that way? So you do this, and there's five million times more energy that does not hit Earth than that does hit Earth. So if you mastered that much energy, oh my gosh. Yes, less than a Category 3 civilization, but it's still badass, really, if you could do that. Let's keep going in. A category one civilization would be one where you master all the energy sources of your home planet. So what kind of energy is going on here? Well, we have geothermal energy, and we know how to tap that. That's a good, that's a check in that box. But there's other energy that we have to run away from, like tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanoes. We don't control that. It controls us. So I don't, I don't have any problems imagining a future where we walk up to the side of a volcano. We, we know how to tap a keg here in, in. So you go up to a volcano and tap the volcano and get, let it outgas some of that energy that, and use that to power the city that would otherwise get leveled by the lava the next time it blew up. Why does it blow up? Because the pressure exceeds its ability to be contained. I, I can picture that future. How about the hurricane that's building in the Gulf? You design systems that could tap that cyclonic energy in such a way that drives the power needs of the city it was otherwise going to level. There's a future for you. 
All right? It's not quite obvious how we would master earthquakes. I would have to think about that a little more. <laughs> it's a huge release of energy when the plates that are intersecting, one gets subducted or shifted, or you know, folks who live in unstable places of the world, not politically unstable, I know we're near Washington, Geo, <laughs> geo, geologically unstable regions of the world, they know all about this. Okay, so we can ask, well, what kind of civilization are we? Because we can't, clearly can't do anything I listed in category three, two, or one. We're category zero. Zero. My colleague Michio Kaku loves talking about that making you feel bad about yourself. We're category zero. We use hardly any energy from Earth as a planet. We're digging fossil fuels out, a limited supply, and we're burning them, and we're affecting our atmosphere. On a cosmic scale, this is embarrassing. And we say, oh, let's look for other intelligent life in the universe. <laughs> it's like, I'm not saying we're not intelligent, but ask yourself, who defined us as intelligent? We did, okay? So why should that be any actual cosmic measure of this sort of thing? I don't know. But in thinking about this, I can't help reflecting on the brilliant book written by and Karen and Gal Luft, Gal Luft, who wrote a book called Turning Oil into Salt. I'll expand on their thesis. It's, it's a brilliant analysis. You say, what could that possibly mean? I'll tell you. There was a day not long ago, 150 years ago, where salt was a strategic asset. And you're thinking, how can that possibly be? What are you talking about? Salt. Strategic. Why? Because before we had electricity and machine and, 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 and appliances, before, how would you survive from the fall harvest to the spring, through the winter? You had to preserve your food. What was the number one way we could preserve the proteins that were available to us in the spring that got harvested? We salt it. What else? We look at salted foods today like it's just a flavor thing for the table. The, the, the sausages, the, the beef jerky, the, the smoked salmon, the, you know, all, all this that's salted. And we say, oh, that's quaint that that was a necessary thing in a day when there's no other way to preserve your food. So everybody knew where the salt came from. Your survival depended on it. General Grant bombed the salt reserves of the Confederacy to limit their ability to fight over the winter months. It was a strategic asset. And I'm, I'm thinking that's where the saying came from, which people said of, of someone who was very kind and generous, they say, oh, they're the salt of the earth. Now, when I first heard that, I had only just learned that salt will kill you from high blood pressure and stroke. So I said, do you really mean that? They seem kind of nice to me. Why are, you call, why are you saying bad things about them? Well, this is an expression left over from a century and a half ago. Even Mahatma Gandhi, in an episode in his relationship with England, got his people together and they made salt. It was a mostly symbolic gesture that they didn't have to depend on England for that resource. But it was quite a statement in the day. But, so how come salt isn't any longer strategic? Because we have 92 ways to preserve the food and we don't even think about it that way. You know, you have jams and jellies and preserves. That word means they preserve the fruit. We don't even think of it, it's preserves. It got preserved. And what do you think cheese is but preserved milk? You can leave cheese out for days and eat it. It'll taste just, well, it'll be a little dry, but it'll be fine. 
Can't do that with milk. But you made the cheese out of the milk. Okay, but that's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about between 1860 and 1910, what happens? Oh, transportation reduces the time between production and consumption. Railroads, this sort of road, all of this. What else? Between farm and city. What else? Oh, electricity, we now have, okay, we had an ice box, but then you have a refrigerator and a freezer and canning. You can now preserve foods 22 different ways. One of them is salt. One of them is salt. It's no longer a strategic asset. It's just one way to accomplish something. And if that's not working out, you just choose another way and you'll be just fine. Well, today, when I look at the wall socket, I just, electricity comes out of the wall. That's a remarkable fact. Because, yeah, you can follow the electrical lines and you get to a power plant. Is it 80% of our power is still made by coal? Okay, fine. But you know something? My electric car doesn't run on coal. It runs on the stored energy in a battery that came out of a wall. We say, well, the coal started it. I don't care that it's coal. That could be hydro, it could be wind, it could be solar, it could be any one of the innovative inventions coming out of conferences like this that feed my wall socket. And if I have an electric car as opposed to an internal combustion engine car where all ICE cars, that of course is the acronym, all ICE cars use gasoline, okay? All jets use jet fuel. They are strategic assets because they have to use that fuel. All right, suppose they don't have to. You plug them in. By the way, fossil fuels can still be one of the things that's, that, is, that competes for that source. Plus, there's some areas of the world. We just heard a talk from Alaska. My wife was raised in Alaska. All right, not as much sun in Alaska as in Texas. They're both oil-producing states. So I think whatever, how are we going to make energy in Alaska is not, probably not solar panels the way you could do it in Texas. Texas, for most of Texas, is all sun all the time. By the way, I met my wife in Texas, so I'm speaking firsthand about a lot of this. So what point am I making here? Oh, uh, if we have 22 different ways of making energy that could be regionally different, depending on the mix of the economy or the will of the citizenry. I don't have to care what's on the other side of that wall plug. Just the way you don't care and you don't even know where your salt comes from. Unless you're one of those well, my, my, uh, Himalayan salt, you know. <laughs> Are you one of those foodies who has four different kinds of salt? Okay, you know where your salt came from but not for strategic reasons, all right? <laughs> because you're, you got too much money for your <laughs> food, so I don't know. <laughs> um, by the way, you know, I'm not a betting person because I studied probability and statistics. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know what the future will bring. Could it be that, yes, there will be a melange of 20 ways we produce energy, and it's just opportunistic by season, by region, by temperament, and, or maybe one form of energy could rise up and supplant them all. We saw some clips from the Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Their ignition facility made headlines back in December. <laughs> Sounds like we got some Lawrence Livermore in the house today. <laughs> Made headlines, oh my gosh. Smash, put some lasers together, get more energy out from a nuclear fusion phenomenon going, taking place there. It's clean energy, there's none of this radioactive uh, uh, waste that comes from fission. So that could be the future. That, that could be the future. 
I was talking to some other people who, who um, in particular, uh, Jamie Heineman from Mythbusters. Uh, there is life after Mythbusters, apparently. He's working on a plasma drill that can drill 10 kilometers down. Wherever you are in the world, go deep enough to where the Earth is hot enough that you can drive some kind of a, a system. Put one of those under every factory plant that's a heavy user of power. You don't have to be under everybody's house. So that'd be a fun future that we cobble together different kinds of energy solutions. So I know everyone is competing for who's going to be the lead, and this may be it's a little bit for everybody. That, that's probably the realistic path. But there's a chance that one will supplant them all. I, if I had to bet, I'd bet on fusion. It's just, I'm just if I had to bet. I, I, but like I said, I don't bet, so ignore what I just said. It's, it's just I know enough physics to know, oh my gosh, this was this. It, it's not quite portable just yet. 192 lasers hitting a pellet the size of a pea. And each of those lasers taken alone is the most powerful laser in the world. So that's not what I call transportable yet. But it, it's a start. Sorry, I'm screaming here. And I, I, I'm almost done here, by the way. I know it looks like I'm just rambling. But there's a point to it all. <laughs> um, either the future is a melange of different sources of energy. Like today, we have 12, 15 different ways of storing and preserving food. No one system emerged above all that, we use it all. Yes, you buy canned food. Yes, except the people with the Him Himalayan salt. They don't buy canned anything today. Uh, okay, so we can ask, how fast does that change? What is the rate of change? Are we ready for it? I'll give two examples of a rate of change. And I will tell you without hesitation, when the system is ready to change, it goes fast. What I mean by that, if it's ready culturally, politically, and especially economically, it slides down a hill like an avalanche. Take, for example, the Wright brothers flew a plane in 1903 okay, at Kitty Hawk. North Carolina. Let's fast forward 54 years. Okay, 54 years ago, you know, it was 1970, I guess, uh, 1969. That's in the memory of at least half the people here. So it's definitely less than a healthy lifetime. What happened in 1957? Oh, Boeing blew the first commercial 707 jet. Do you, do you realize that the distance the Wright brothers flew on their first flight was less than the wingspan of the 707 jet? I have quotes even from the Wright brothers at the time. Was it 1910? Uh, airplane will never, it's good for small trips, but it'll never cross the Atlantic, said Orville Wright, who invented the damn airplane. <laughs> I got another one. These are people predicting and that they're really not plugged in. In the year 1900, everyone is trying to figure out what the future is going to bring. Someone who worked for the New York Central Railroad wrote in a special edition of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, a big newspaper of the day in New York, a pull-out section, what the world will be like 100 years from now. They got everything wrong. And the head of the New York Central Railroad in 1900, coming off the heels of airships, the railroad crossing the country, the Orient Express from Europe to Asia, we had steamships crossing the ocean, I quote, and this is somebody who worked for the railroad, I quote, we can scarcely imagine that advances in transportation in the 20th century will be as great as were those in the 19th century. That is the most boneheaded <laughs> statement ever made by anybody. 
Three years later, of course, we are flying. So, oh, maybe 54 years is not fast for you. Right, let me show you something that's a little faster. If I go to my first slide. Yeah, I brought slides. There it goes. <laughs> uh, take a look at that. That's the Easter Parade, on Fifth Avenue, New York City. Um, if you... But take a look at that. Everything you see is a horse-drawn carriage. Every vessel in the street is a horse-drawn carriage, except for that. That is one automobile. among horse-drawn carriages in the year 1900. Well, let's fast forward, not 54 years, not 40 or 30 or 20, or le let's fast forward 13 years, 13 years, the same scene. Whoa, okay, zoom in. One horse-drawn carriage. 13 years ago was 2010. Within 13 years, the horse on whose back we literally and figuratively built civilization for thousands of years, within 13 years was basically gone. You couldn't give away a horse in 1915. And with it went all the industry that went with it. The, 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 the first of the pooper scoopers came from that era, the horse manure people, the buggy whip makers, the carriage drivers, all of that. So when I say in this year, which is what, uh, 2023, I'll make a prediction so I can be made a fool of by people who come after me, that by 2050, 100% of the cars in the road will be self-driving electric. And you go say, oh, how can you say that? No, we're not on that pace. Look what happened then. What would you have said in 1900 when you see this newfangled automobile? If I told you in 10 years you won't find a horse, you'll say, no, I don't believe you. Things can't change that fast, but they did. Self-driving electric? Self-driving, a self-driving car can go 90 miles an hour, one car length from the car in front of it. And it's not drunk, it's not putting on makeup, it's not texting. Actually, it could text and it wouldn't affect its performance, okay? <laughs> it's, it's. <laughs> in the, this past year, we lost 40,000 people to highway accidents, to automobile accidents, pedestrians and drivers and passengers, 40,000 people. We just live with that. That's an entire Vietnam's worth of dead Americans every year on the roads. Self-driving electric, I wanna be ready for that. I don't wanna say, no, we don't need, I don't wanna, we'll be ready for, oh, by the way, if you like regular cars that you control, someone will build a car track for you. Okay, in the same way, what do we have today? We have horse stables. You can still ride a horse, right? If you, if you love horse, if the horse is not something you ever wanted to give up, we, we got that for you. <laughs> Anyhow, let me just, uh, we're about to break here and, and I'll go into chat with the head of ARPA E. Um, I just wanna say I'm highly enthusiastic I take my cues from how people have behaved in the past, what we've accomplished, what our achievements were, what our failures were. I look to see what were the sources of those failures, what fed the achievements. It's, it's summits like this with the enthusiasm and ingenuity that make, oh, we lost the slide. Can we put the slide back up? That make that happen, okay. <laughs> and when that happens, we definitely are creating the future that we all dreamed we'd be living in.
Thank you all for your attention. Well, thank you, Neil. That was so inspirational. Thank you. Well, I, I don't think you need me, though, because you, <laughs> you all are here for that reason, right? So I'm just, I'm just a cheerleader. Not, you, know, you all are, your energy, time, and intellect is all in the right place at the right time. Yeah. We need the whole community, and you play such an important role in our community. So I wanted to start asking you about, in the context of our summit, the RPE Summit, and you know, RPE's mission is to be out in front, take risks, explore the technical areas that might not yet receive a lot of attention in the marketplace. How important do you believe this non-conformity and risk-taking is to scientific progress? Uh, what I found is that the larger an organization gets, the, the more risk-averse they become. And we say, oh, it's big, and, and then you realize that the progress of science, technology, and civilization itself begins to stall, and it's just sort of business as usual. So concepts such as ARPA, well, you're ARPA-E, but you're not the first ARPA, okay? Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> old timers here remember ARPANET, you know, had some very foundational contributions to what today we call the internet. And so to the extent that this model can be duplicated in other sectors, uh, I think it's foundational and fundamental to create an environment, an umbrella under which a person can have a crazy idea that would not otherwise get the support, not even from a venture capitalist. Because if it's, if it's not so crazy that you get VC interest, then you don't need ARPA. You don't need ARPA-E. You need ARPA-E to say, all right, no one is looking this way. We'll, 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 let's investigate. And you mentioned risk. Uh, the public, I think, has a hard time understanding failure. Mm -hmm. They think failure is bad. And yeah, you don't want to fail if you didn't have to. But if you're doing something that no one has ever done before, failure is a fundamental part of that, as any scientist on the frontier knows. But the public doesn't know that. And I had a professor uh, when I was a postdoc, uh, his name is Martin Schwarzschild, who is a, was a nephew of Carl Schwarzschild, responsible for the famous Schwarzschild radius of a black hole. Um, he tragically died on the front in the First World War, the Carl Schwarzschild. Um, but he said, he was old, and he died while I was there on campus. He said, the day you stop making mistakes, is the day you can be sure you are no longer on the frontier. And I've never forgotten that. So mistakes in that context is the same as a failed experiment. And so, yeah, I don't know if you've you quantified the failure rate that you expect or want to have, but it'd be nice to say we expect 80% of these to fail. That's, that sends a message. And it doesn't stigmatize the fact that you tried something and did not succeed at it. So that's my way of saying yes to, your answer, to answer your question. Thank you. That's, yes. a, that's a really helpful perspective. And indeed, we do take a lot of risk. And we do expect pretty high failure rates. But that's how we push forward innovation. So thank you. Also, oh, by the way, you don't want to fail doing the same thing someone tried before that also failed. You, don't, you want to learn from the failure. Just want to make that clear. If any journalists out there, that's what we're talking about, all right? And there's an old saying in the rocket community, because there's nothing more interesting to look at than a rocket that explodes on the launch pad, right? Provided there's no loss of life, of course. Um, it's like watching a train wreck or watching, you know, all right. So you speak to a rocket engineer, and they say, oh, it looks like that one failed. And their answer is, no, 
It was an experiment rich in data. <laughs> <laughs> data is important. Data is important. <laughs> data are important. Yes. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Another aspect of ARPA is a lot of what we try to encourage is that the multidisciplinary approach to working towards making these technologies and inventing and, and I would love to hear your perspective and how critical you see this kind of cooperative multidisciplinary team to advance scientific progress is. There is no progress without it. If you look at entire fields that exist today that we take for granted as being fields unto themselves. But when they were birthed, it involved stapling together two different branches of science. What is biochemistry if not some fusion of biology and chemistry? Mm -hmm. I don't know that biochemistry was a thing in the 19th century. We had the biologists and we had the chemists. Biochemistry, let's keep going. And a lot of it involves my field. There was particle physics, which we realized we need to know a little bit about if we're going to talk about the Big Bang. Because there were no stars back then. The whole universe was particles at high energy. That's what particle physicists worry about. So we partner up with them. There's a field called astroparticle physics. And we're looking for life in the universe. It's astrobiology. We're looking at the chemistry of interstellar clouds, it's astrochemistry. Whole journals with those titles. So if you stay stovepipe, you will miss the intersections that nature has built in. Nature doesn't say this and only this is biology and this is it and never the twain shall meet. Nature is a continuum among all of these fields and we just happen to pop them into textbooks because it's easier for us to think about it that way, because previously funding only went that way, or the materials in your labs only allowed that kind of experiment versus another. But when you have a funding agency that umbrellas multiple branches of inquiry, forcing them to have coffee together, and you yeah. hear, you hear, oh, is that what you were, wait, is that what you were working on? I was thinking <laughs> about that the other day, and look at this new tool that I have, and let's plug it in this way, and out comes a whole new thing. And so, my answer to you is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, by the way, you don't just have to staple <laughs> fields together. What we did in my field beginning in the 1990s, we decided to ask a different question. Instead of saying, what is this star? What is this planet? What is, we started asking, what are the origins of things? So NASA, if you look, one of the more successful branches of funding are the origins projects. Mm -hmm. Because now the question transcends the branch of science you might need to tap to address it. And then you piece together the people with expertise, which when brought together, can answer questions that no one even thought to ask without it. So the funding umbrella is what brings people together. You're doing the right thing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we want to hear, oh, okay. right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. OK, you touched on this before, but I'm going to ask again. We are ARPA-E, so we're focused on energy. So what role do you think energy plays in society? Yeah, so if, if you look at the history of civilization, some of the greatest civilizations of the past, by the way, greatest for me in that context is not a value judgment as much as it is a statement of how much control they had over themselves and of the world. Okay, so I'm not value judging that, I'm simply observing it. Those civilizations, on average, had a much higher per capita consumption of energy than civilizations that did not. Those that explored, those that went industrial sooner than others. You just add all of this up. And so it seems to me, if you want to do things, if you want to 
do things that have never been done before and you have an idea that can make it happen, typically it requires more energy than you were currently using at the time you thought it up. We happen to live in a time where energy consumption has been a little bit demonized, right? If you drive a big car, somebody's gonna wag their finger at you. Mm -hmm. If you leave your lights on, if you, it's become demonized because of its impact on the environment. But if you can produce energy that has no negative impact on the environment, it can transform civilization. That's what it did in Iceland. Not 20 years ago, they were mostly fossil fuels. But wait a minute, Iceland is sitting on basically an active volcano, okay? And there's heat everywhere. We filmed four episodes of Cosmos in Iceland because different directions you pointed the camera looked like different formation episodes in the origin of the Earth with smoke coming out of the grounds and, and, and it, tide pools. <laughs> so, so you know what they did? They went geo, geothermal. It's sitting right there, and they don't have to go down 10 kilometers. They have a blue lagoon that's heated just from the heat that's right down below. And so they converted, but that took energy. It took investment. It took time, and the population had to buy into that. Do you realize, as what I understood, they don't have to plow their roads. They heat their roads. <laughs> and you don't have to heat them to room temperature. You can heat those puppies to 33 degrees, and it melts off. It could be snowing, and you're driving 70 miles an hour, and you're not going to spin out. That's a transformed culture. And by the way, not everyone can do that, because the heat isn't 10 feet below your feet. OK? So I, I don't see oil going away. There will be places where it'll work best. Uh, I don't, it'll just be reduced compared to everything else that becomes available in the innovations that you currently oversee. Thank you for that. You know, my expertise is in heat transfer, so I love heat that answer. I love me some heat transfer. <laughs> Look, can I tell you a fast heat transfer yes. story? Yes, please okay. do. Okay, it's fast. It's fast. I, one of the public lectures I give is called An Astrophysicist Goes to the Movies, where I show clips where they badly get the science wrong, while others where they get it right. So I'm not just a totally negative. And so I highlight this in about 40 movie clips. Well, one of them is about heat transfer, and it's from the movie West Side Story. Okay, Tony and Maria first meet each other, okay? And <laughs> Maria said they first meet, and they're in love on first sight. And she says, my hands are cold. And she reaches to his hands, and then she says, so are yours. No, that's not how that works, okay? <laughs> Two people in skin contact cannot both feel cold, okay? That is not how that happens. Anybody who's ever jumped into bed with another human being, <laughs> <laughs> One of you is going to be cold, the other is going to be warm, okay? So it's heat transfer mistake yes. in the yes. movies. But that didn't require a grant from RPE to, to, to answer that. You just have to test it. That's right. Just to be clear, and we're on the same page, if you are losing heat to someone else, no matter what temperature you started, you will feel cold. And the person receiving your heat, no matter what temperature they are, will feel warm. Period. <laughs> Get me angry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I know you don't take bets. You just said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't really take bets. But no. you've talked about making predictions for the future. Mm -hmm and how quickly society can transform if one looks at history along a slightly longer timeline. Can you share some predictions in regard to energy innovation over the next few decades? 
so that I can be made a fool in 30 years. <laughs> okay, I'd be happy to. So, <laughs> so whatever I say, I guarantee it will not be as boneheaded as our head of the New York Central Railroad in the year 1900. So here's an interesting thing to me. Again, there's some old timers here. I count myself among your ranks. We remember the future imagined when we were living in the 1950s or 60s. In that future, there were flying cars, you know, uh, uh, sidewalk, moving sidewalks, and that never happened. And so maybe you can be a little disappointed because we don't have flying cars. By the way, I, I think we actually do, but that's a different conversation. We probably don't have time for it. But <laughs> we live among flying cars right now for an interesting geometric physics reason. There are flying cars all around us right now. But if, you have, if we have time, I'll describe it. Um, is there anything an event after this in this room? We have time, don't <laughs> okay. we? We have time. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so what they got wrong relative to what actually happened is they imagined a future of unlimited energy. Because practically everything you see going on requires some huge investment of energy being manifest in small sized engines. And that's just not what happened. What happened was, it's not that the cost of energy dropped, the cost of information dropped. Information technology, which is a trifling investment of power relative to machines, is where the real advances took place. So we were transformed by computers and not by physical machines that take fuel mm -hmm. with a fuel tank. And so that, that, that would, they, we just bet on the wrong horse there, okay, to use an earlier reference. And so if everyone in this room is successful, collectively or individually, then maybe a future of unlimited energy is real. And that's a different looking civilization. Oh my gosh. So much of what we do, value, care about, would change. I remember thinking about this in my day when I was programmed computers. I coded maybe 50,000 lines of uh, computer programs over my life, over the decades. Each decade had a different thing you had to had to compromise on. Early on, there wasn't much storage capacity. So you had to program in such a way that you would swap data in and out. You couldn't keep it all in one place. So you were a clever programmer if you could do that and accomplish that. Then storage disks got, became uh, uh, smaller and higher capacity. So then you didn't have to program that way. You could program a different way. And then computers got more powerful so that I didn't need a special purpose computer, which we had. We had a special computer that only calculated Newton's laws. It was wired that way. It would calculate Newton's laws in an instant. We would bring these chips around and use them in Europe and in the Far East and in America. And then computing power got so fast. An off-the-shelf computer was as powerful as our, as our uniquely designed chip. So... This is a micro version of how we had to change everything to accommodate what was available to us, and at every advance was better than what was before. So, a completely transformed civilization. Uh, oh my gosh. But I, I can't think of energy, but I can think of a couple of things I'd like to share. Just okay, a couple? Please. You know what I want? Uh, we, we got the human genome going, right? All right. Uh, by the way, we're not the most interesting genome out there. We, we want to think that. I was taught that in school until I learned, no, we can't really soar like a condor. No, I can't regrow my limbs like a newt. Oh, but we're at the top of the, the evolutionary <laughs> chart. No, but your underarms stink. And you got <laughs> bad breath. But we're at the top of the evolutionary chart. If I drop you butt naked in 70% of the places on Earth, you were dead 15 minutes later. But we're at the top, so I have to overcome that. In doing so, 
In 30 years, you know what I want? We find that part of the, I'm speaking naively here, but with great hope, we find that part of the genome of newts that regenerates their limbs, put it into humans, so that we can regenerate lost limbs and put the veterans in the front of the line there to regrow the limbs that we lost in the service of the world. And that would, that would make us equal to newts at that point. <laughs> but that would be interesting. I foresee, I foresee a boutique medicine. Why do you have side effects when you take a medicine? Because it's got stuff that you don't want or you don't need, but they need it for that. And if I know your perfect genetic profile, I'll go in there with this exact chemical profile and it'll match it and you're cured immediately. I foresee that. I foresee a perfect antiviral serum where viruses are just a thing of the past. And uh, also, I, like I said in my presentation that was meant to be brief, sorry, uh, that electric self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. People look back and say, you used to what? You used to drive even when you were sleepy? And you used to stop for gas? You used to do what? And your next generation will look at us like we are like we rode horse and buggy. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I think about it. And I, I don't, well, that was, I think those are all your, there's something, can, if, we're, if we're about to end, can I spend two minutes and read something to the audience? Please do. Okay. I have one more question. Oh, I'll do the one more question okay. and I dig up what I'm trying to read here. Okay, go okay. ahead, go ahead. And this is something that I think you as an astrophysicist could really provide a great perspective on. Delighted to. So, we have made notable groundbreaking progress in fusion recently, you just mentioned it, the science that powers stars, and we're incorporating more different materials and minerals in our approach to energy storage than ever before. Materials are maybe more commonplace out in the cosmos than here on Earth. Oh, um, excellent. What lessons can we learn from stellar phenomenon, and how should we look to incorporate space into our plans for the energy future. Again, you put an umbrella over multiple fields of study, you will be amazed at what cross-pollination it fosters. So, here we are in space. You know what I want? It would be kind of cool if the solar system became our backyard and not just some special rare place that rich people go. Well, why would we want it to be our backyard? Well, first, if the asteroid's coming that's going to take us out, I want to be able to know how to go nudge it. Because mm -hmm. you know if the dinosaurs had a space program, they'd still be here. <laughs> you know. You know, okay? I'm pretty sure, <laughs> okay? So, 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 and then there are asteroids, metallic asteroids, that have more gold in them than have ever been mined in the history of the Earth. And gold is just proxy for other elements that are rare earth elements, the platinum group, all of this. And we're what? We're fighting wars on earth to gain access to rare earth materials when it's common in the universe? In fact, I see space exploration gaining access to not only the sources of energy in space, 24 seven exposure to the sun, something you don't get on earth, but also access to these mineral sources and, 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 and rare earth elements, mm -hmm. common space elements. <laughs> I foresee a day where that entire category of war goes away entirely. We may still fight over what, what god you worship or who, who you sleep with or how reflective your skin is to sunlight, but among the categories of organized warfare, fighting over what's in a watering hole, I think will be a thing of the past. And that's a prediction that space empowers because we're no longer limited to just what's on this third rock from the sun because the rest of the universe can be brought into the service of who we are and what we want to be in the future of civilization. Thank you. That's very aspirational and very inspirational. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And would you like to read May your? I? Yes, please do. May I? I only just thought to do this now, so sorry to I'm squeezing it in on your life here. So this 
This was posted just a couple of days ago on the internet. Anonymous letter to the world. The equinox, March 20th, 23. 100 years ago, 100 years ago, humans on Earth were emerging from a viral pandemic that killed millions of people worldwide. Meanwhile, people died of diseases that today are commonly cured. Many are long forgotten. With vastly improved nutrition, medicine, and public health measures, we're now living 50% longer than we did back then. The environment was quite unhealthy a hundred years ago. With air, rivers, lakes, and land contaminated by industrial pollutants. Though we've made many improvements over the decades, the ignored warning from scientists about global climate change continue to haunt us. Legislation to empower the disenfranchised, long resisted by those in power, was hard fought one of many progressive triumphs to follow that comprise the moral arc of the universe as it bends, however slowly, towards justice for all citizens of planet Earth. Wars continue, but there are fewer of them. And in the past century, we've reduced the fraction of the world's population living in extreme poverty by a factor of five. So overall, Things are looking better, much better than they were way back in 2023. Sincerely, Citizen of the Year 2123. Just something to think about. I posted that on the Equinox just to get people to think about what we might take for granted today and what we might look like to the generation that occupies this earth 100 years from now. And uh, I think this gives me hope, hope beyond what I thought even might have been possible. That, so the government can do good things. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry for any official government officials out there. Uh, sorry, but I'm feeling good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Thank, Thank you. you.